Okay, colleagues, thank you very much for uh, joining us for this panel on uh, vulnerability. So this is a very interesting concept to explore after lunch, since we are all vulnerable a little bit to, to the siesta uh, temptation, but we will try to keep you awake. So this is a very useful concept uh, in the context of migration, vulnerability. You know that one year ago there, there was the UN summit in New York, which um, adopted uh, the New York Declaration for uh, Refugees and Migration. And uh, this declaration opened the way for two global compacts, one on migration and one on refugees. But also the decision was adopted uh, to uh, try and um, work, to, to work and have adopted guidelines on uh, migrants in vulnerable situations. So this is a concept that um, has a lot of um, currency in the context of the United Nations. When the United Nations speak about vulnerability, usually they speak about situational vulnerability. So it is not so much the personal characteristics of the person that determine his or her vulnerability, but it is rather the circumstances in which the migrant or the refugees find themselves. So if you look at uh, the draft that already exists of these uh, guidelines, you will see that one of the situations of vulnerability is detention. So detention, by definition, puts migrants and refugees in a vulnerable situation. And then if you look at the groups of people who, in this vulnerable situation, are particularly vulnerable, you are going to find pregnant or nursing migrants, elderly migrants, migrants with a disability, survivors of torture or trauma, migrants with physical or mental health needs, trafficked persons, stateless persons, and refugees. And then you also have children. So children belong to a category of themselves, a particularly vulnerable category of migrants, which find themselves when placed in detention in a situation of additional vulnerability. So I think this combination of the two vulnerabilities makes today's um, uh, panel very, uh, I mean, hope will generate some good ideas from today's panel. If you look at the European Convention on Human Rights, in Article 5 of the Convention, you are going to see that the Convention accepts detention as a response to vulnerability, because there is an, a, a sub-article in Article 5.1 which says that children can be detained for educational purposes, but also that children can be detained in order to be brought before a competent legal authority. So we can imagine that some authority might claim that in order to bring a migrant child in front of the guardian, an unaccompanied minor in front of the guardian, can fall under this exception. This is the theory and the imagination. If we look at the case law, we are going to see a clear trend in the case law against the detention of minors. And we have Thomas Traub here from the Registry of the European Court of Human Rights, who is going to explain to us how this concept of vulnerability plays out in the case law. And of course, Thomas knows the case law very well. He has also worked for the UNHCR on the ground and in the headquarters. So I think he is uh, uniquely well equipped to explain to us the trend in the case law. As perhaps uh, we started discussing in the morning, we are going to examine different situations. So we are going to examine children seeking asylum, whether they can be detained. We are going to examine the question of unaccompanied minors, whether they can be detained in order to be protected. And then we are going to look into the situation of minors who are facing expulsion, return together with the families, whether this can be uh, whether detention can be justified in these circumstances. What we are going to look at uh, uh, during this panel is the impact of detention in these different situations. And uh, of course, uh, with the special representative, Thomas Bocek, we have visited a lot of places where migrant children are detained, and we have um, our own views, which you can, found, you can find in the reports, about the impact of detention on migrant children. In the morning, we saw that we tend to make a distinction between the conditions of detention and detention in itself. 
And this is also a topic that can be usefully explored this afternoon to make this distinction between conditions and the effects of being deprived of their liberty can have on migrant and refugee children. We have had a lot of good work done on this by the International Detention Coalition, also by the Quaker Council for European Affairs, and this is a very good initiative of a faith-based organization trying to participate in a very useful manner in a public debate of a great concern. But we must also listen to the views of the psychologists. We must try and collect some ground evidence about the impact of the detention. Because lawyers, we can agree and disagree about many things, but I think what is important is to listen to the specialists. Eh? And we have here a very good specialist, Maria Bana. So she's a psychologist, she works in a hospital, but also she has visited a lot of migrants in very many different places of detention in Hungary. Her organization, Cordelia, is the only Hungarian organization that participates in this Center for the Rehabilitation of Torture Victims. Is this correct? More or less, yes. So this speaks in itself, the only Hungarian NGO that works in this field. So she's going to talk to us about the psychological impact that detention has on migrant and refugee children. And then together with Thomas, perhaps we can explore the way that the findings of uh, the experts of NGOs like this can be explored in human rights litigation, also in the decision-making process leading to uh, the judgments of the European Court of Human Rights. And um, as Maria is going to explain, uh, the certificates that they issue can be used in connection with applications for interim relief, for interim, uh, for provisional measures that the European Court of Human Rights sometimes issues, but also they can be used in order to reach uh, the proper decision. From uh, the special representatives and my own point of view, uh, of course we can try and make a distinction between conditions and the detention in itself, but sometimes we have to bear in mind that the decision to detain has a huge impact on the conditions themselves. For example, if you take the right to education, I think in the morning we heard a rather optimistic message from the CPT about how education can be organized in a prison-like setting. With uh, Thomas, we have not seen one single place where education was properly organized in detention facilities. So discussing about you know, the conditions and the decision to detain itself sometimes sounds theoretical. And if you don't have a proper education structure, this is going to have a huge impact on the psychological, on the, it will going to have a huge psychological impact, also an impact on the development of the personality of the children. So you have a huge debate there, and uh, as Thomas is going to explain to us, from the point of view of the European Court of Human Rights, this is usually examined under Article 3 of the Convention, whether the detention itself, whether the conditions amount to inhuman and degrading treatment. On the other hand, there is another standard, which is the best interest of the child. And this is the standard in the International Convention for the Protection of the Rights of the Children, the standard that you have in the emerging guidelines on vulnerability of the United Nations. And I think that this session, from the lawyer's point of view, might also help us bridge the gap between these two standards, the best interests of the child and inhuman and degrading treatment. If you take into consideration the concept of vulnerability, perhaps at the end of the day, we might see the two standards converging. But I don't want to take any more of the speaker's time since I'm going to be very tough on their own time. So as you can see, I have kept to my 10 minutes and I think the decision of the organizers to start with the expert, with the psychologist is a very good one. So Maria is going to give us the take of the psychologist and then Thomas is going to, to explain to us how this is taken on board by the European Court of Human Rights. So, Maria, the floor is yours. Thank you. So it seems I will not be seeing my presentation in front of me, only at my left, so I'll try to 
and so thank you everybody for for having chosen this panel and thank you for the organizers for having invited me as i guess the only mental health professional here my presentation will maybe a bit more um, simplistic and colorful than that of those with legal background but uh, it definitely you know, shows a different perspective. So um, my name is Maria Barna, uh, and the organization that I'm representing is the Cordelia Foundation, which, uh, as Stefano said, is the only Hungarian member of the International Rehabilitation Council for Torture Victims. Uh, we are a trauma center, so we are a medical organization, and we are the only ones in Hungary providing mental health care to asylum seekers and refugees and migrants in immigration detention. Uh, our specialization is on torture survivors, and we have just last year issued a report on the consequences of detention on torture survivors, but that's not the topic uh, of today. Uh, we definitely have a lot of cases, families and uh, um, unaccompanied minors in detention, so I just also brought you some of my own cases as examples. Um, as I said, Cordelia is the only mental health care providers in the Hungarian asylum settings, which means that we have been present for over 20 years in all the asylum facilities of the countries, be them detention centers or open facilities. Uh, I cannot skip uh, a point in saying that since Hungary has introduced the mass detention of all the new coming asylum seekers in Hungary, including children, including family, including unaccompanied minors above 14, and is placing all of these people, hundreds of people, in detention along the Serbian border in these so-called transit zones, uh, Cordelia has no access to the transit zones. We are not the only NGO that is being denied access. But with us being denied access, this means that currently asylum seekers in Hungary have absolutely no access to any sort of psychiatric or psychosocial support. Um, yes, this is something that I thought is still re important to remember. Um, but I will not be talking about the Hungarian situation because that's not our topic today. So let me just first start with saying some things, uh, some general findings about what detention uh, does to migrants, be them minors or adults, be them coming from whichever country and independently from the asylum or the detention facility that they are actually being placed in. What is important to know about the de about detention in that it is that it affects also those individuals who were mentally healthy prior to detention. We know that asylum seekers, uh, among asylum seekers, there's a much higher prevalence of mental uh, disorders, but even those who do not suffer from any of these are become vulnerable in detention. Um, the studies are very um, using different methodologies, so the percentages vary from study to study, but basically all of those that I have come across say that at least 50% of the people in detention start suffering from mental health um, disorders or symptoms, which might become permanent or not, but they do appear. Um, what is also very important is that the effects of detention on mental health do not last as long as detention is actually taking place, but they, are, they can become permanent, and they are definitely much more long-lasting than the detention itself. This is mainly because of the fact that there we have seen, and we have seen this in person as well, that there are permanent, enduring personality changes occurring in people in detention. And these personality changes affect the way how they function later on when they are reinserted in their own community and let's say they have to struggle with um, issues of integration or being deported to their home country. But in any case, uh, their functioning is hindered by the effects of uh, uh, their mental health problems that they have um, that started appearing in detention. Uh, I said that there is already some body of research on this topic. I just wanted to just you know, flash it for a moment here. Uh, this is the DEVAS report, uh, um, which uh, has examined in 23 member states the effect of uh, detention uh, on asylum seekers, on different groups of asylum seekers. This is a big uh, report. I will not be citing it very much, but uh, it has uh, specific parts on children as well. So you can find it online. This is, a, this is one of the, um, of the studies that was connected, con uh, conducted in Europe and uh, within uh, uh, asylum seekers, so it's important. Um, if 
we detach a bit from from the legal definitions of of detention and we just focus a bit on on what detention means on an emotional level uh, for a, for a person um we i think you don't you don't necessarily have to be professionals who are in direct contact with asylum seekers or with children in detention in order to be able to imagine some of these um some of these effects or some of these meanings but uh, um the list is of course endless but what i have seen as the most prevalent is that independently from how the detention is how are the physical circumstances there there are some things that occur uh, mentally and emotionally in detainees heads and one of the most important is the complete sense of disempowerment and of loss of control uh, they lose control over their personal and daily life they lose control over how and in what ways they keep contact with their families if at all that's possible they lose uh, control uh, many in many cases they even lose control by losing information on their asylum case it happens very often that those who are in detention we are talking about asylum seekers uh, have a very restricted access to their lawyer or to their case officer and they simply have no means to get information about, about where their process is going while you can imagine that for somebody in prolonged detention the only way to keep up hope is to know that in the meantime my asylum process is going on this will end someday even if I cannot know specifically on what day so uh, isolation social isolation from the fellow detainees is also very common and what we can see and what is very important is that even if an individual is detained let's say together with their family what happens is that they are still forcibly uprooted from their own community uh, they have maybe no uh, ways to practice their religion and uh, there are many other forms of isolation that that take place and that people suffer from very very severely. This picture is uh, uh, from um, one of the parts of the Hungarian transit zone. Uh, this is a graph that I put together myself. I don't know if there is any point in actually remembering the numbers because this is again something that different researchers uh, uh, come up with different percentages with. But uh, what I wanted to stress is the triad of mental health disorders that appears in detention. Let, uh, it's independently from whether we're talking about adults or children, but this triad is that of depressive symptoms, anxiety symptoms, and PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Disorder. So uh, there are some symptoms which we have observed in practically almost all uh, the people in detention. Sleep disorders appear, um, problems of uh, memory and concentration appear. Uh, this is um, um, pretty general. Uh, those symptoms who are a, which are a bit less prevalent, but still, as you can see, uh, around 40% is that of an increased uh, irritability, intrusive thoughts, um, anxiety, and different forms of social isolation. But even symptoms as severe as psychological states, so states in which the person actually loses touch with reality and is in many cases hospitalized, occur in a very high percentage of the cases, so around 20%. These can be um, um, transient um, um, psychotic symptoms, but still we are talking about very se severe mental health uh, cases here. So uh, when we come to the specificities regarding children, I just thought of uh, mentioning to you two different groups, which I see as many different, when it, very different when it comes to, uh, to, to their status in detention. One of them is children who are uh, detained together with their families, and the other is the group of unaccompanied minors. Uh, there are many differences between them. When we're talking about children, um, with their families. What is important to stress is that here, det in detention, detained children with their families can be as old as 
two or three years old. We have newborn babies in the transit zones in Hungary at the moment, so there is really uh, no limitation in age in this case. What is very important, and I will not get into the details of child psychiatry here, but what is very important is that children who are deten detained with their families uh, are very, very, very strongly influenced by the mental health status of their parents. This is quite obvious. What we see, and I also brought you a case uh, in point, is that uh, the whole structure of the family changes when the parent uh, is suffering of mental health problems and is Enable, unable to function as a parent. Uh, we have this term parentification. I don't know how, how, who many, how many of you are familiar with it, but uh, parentification is the phenomenon that takes place when in a family the father or the mother stops being able to function as a parent and the child has to take over the role of the parent. Whoever has encountered families in detention must have come across one or two of these cases. Children take over the role of communicating with the authorities, communicating with the social workers, bringing food to their parents. Uh, the case that I brought you uh, is the case of Rahim, who is a father. Um, he's, uh, he's from Afghanistan and he arrived uh, to Hungary last year together with his seven-year-old son. He lost his wife and his almost newborn baby girl on the way. Uh, they were uh, he didn't know whether they were dead or not, but he had lost them. He arrived with his son uh, to one of the Hungarian facilities, and the way how we came across him was actually through the child, so through the seven-year-old child who was uh, feeding the father and who was uh, going to the social workers, going to the doctor, reporting about his father's uh, state. And uh, he was really behaving like an adult, and what was particular is that you couldn't really actually see any uh, distress on him or any symptoms on him. When we started uh, treating the father, which included also uh, medication, psychotropic medications, because he was in a really severe case of depression, what we could see is that as the conditions of the father improve, as he's able to take back some of his duties as a father, the child started regressing immediately into quite a severe uh, uh, case of, uh, with many psychiatric symptoms actually. He became aggressive, he became impossible to communicate with, he lost all his sense of responsibility and he regressed into such a state of uh, uh, mind that actually he was later on, later on treated by our, by our child psychiatrist. Mm, so, and actually when parents become such severely affected by their mental health problems that they have to, let's say, be hospitalized, then actually a physical separation of the family takes place as well. We have had such cases in the Hungarian transit zone as well. So the parent is hospitalized and the child remains there without practically a guardian in, in the detention center. Uh, when we talk about the consequences of detention on children, we do not have to only mention those psychological um, uh, problems that I just mentioned in the case generally of, of adults, but we have to think of the fact that in the case of children, we are talking about behavioral consequences and we are talking about developmental consequences of, as well. So long-term detention can actually affect uh, the, the cognitive development of children as well, which is a very severe uh, thing if, if, if you think of it, be, because being it irreversible. Um, I will not go into details about uh, behavioral symptoms, but let's say that there are many specific child psychiatry disorders which, which occur in detention, which we have seen in detention. Um, the other group that I wanted to mention to you is that of unaccompanied minors. What you may also well know is that very often unaccompanied minors uh, belong to an older age group, so they are very often adolescent, adolescent boys, the age of 15, 16. Um, what we see is that uh, they are an extremely vulnerable group in detention for many reasons. One is that, uh, uh, I know about Hungary, but I know also about many other member states, is that uh, age determination procedures are very, very problematic in, in many member states. So we very often see, but really very often see, unaccompanied minors, so minors aged 15, 16, ending up in detention with adults. 
uh, in which cases they become so vulnerable that very often they are abused by other detainees, or let's say they choose to be uh, safeguarded by one particular adult in order to avoid abuse by all the others. But in any case, they just uh, reach a very precarious and very, very dangerous uh, you know, uh, state. Uh, substance abuse is, and uh, other behavioral problems such as self-harm and suicidal behavior are also very common in their case because uh, what we simply see is that they are very often unable to express uh, their symptoms in uh, in the form of negative emotions. So they use, let's say, more primitive, more childish ways of coping, and uh, substance abuse belongs to these. Substance abuse in the circumstances of the detention means medication, obviously, um, because, of course, they do not have access to others. What I brought you is a case of uh, Sedikula. He's not the one on the picture, obviously, but it could just as well be him. He's a patient of mine who as we are sitting here now, is in detention in the transit zone along the Serbian border. He's uh, 16 and he's been detained for more than 10 months. He spent more than half a year in an adult detention center because Hungarian authorities uh, simply have not accepted his identification, which said that he's under 18. After half a year, the court, uh, um, after half a year, he was at the beginning quite healthy mentally, but what happened in the meantime, uh, I was seeing him on a weekly basis, was that uh, He's from Nangarhar, the Nangarhar province of Afghanistan, and his, his younger brother, who was 14, was killed uh, instead of him, him having left the country. And he had, uh, he had uh, been given information about this while he was in detention. And uh, as you can see, he, his mental state gradually started deteriorating. He started having nightmares. Uh, he was screaming constantly in the night. Uh, he did not remember any of these nightmares, but uh, his, um, his um, companions or his roommates were constantly coming and saying that we cannot sleep because the, we have to constantly wake him up from his own dreams. And uh, he became so vulnerable uh, that uh, we tried to write a medical report uh, to argue for it to him for him to be released from detention we were not able to argue that he's not that he's actually a minor because we are not in the position to do that but we were trying to appeal on his on his uh, psychological status and uh, what happened after almost half a year that uh, uh, he was in this adult detention center is that the court ruled that okay we will release him from detention and that's how he ended up in the transit zone, because Hungarian authorities claim that the transit zone is not a detention center. So he's been there uh, ever since. Uh, months have passed. And, uh, and uh, I wanted to bring you this case. It's not a therapeutic case, as you well know, because currently I'm not even able to actually see him. Uh, we're communicating in writing. but. Uh, but this is just to illustrate that we are talking about detention of children and in some member states, and Hungary is a new member state, this is happening in mass. So at the mo in, 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 uh, oh, um, last month they were, there were more than 200 children in detention in, in the transit zones. So uh, I will just uh, mention briefly about treatment that we, uh, Cordelia offers many forms of, uh, of treatment and of psychotherapy. Um, what I regard as the three basics for whoever does this in whatever framework is that to have interpreters who are independent from the staff of the detention centers, to have therapists who are again independent from the staff of the detention centers, and uh, you know, to have some form of private space to conduct uh, uh, interventions. Um, there are, of course, uh, many other things uh, which, are, which we find important, and we have developed a methodology very specific to this target group, um, which I'm happy to talk about to anyone who's interested. But I think this would be it for the purpose of, of this panel. Thank you very much. And I'm open for questions later on, of course. <laughs> Well, thank you very much, Maria. So the big challenge is uh, now for us to take uh, these findings from, from the grassroots, from the experts, and taking them up to, to policy level. And I'm sure there are many policy makers in the room who have listened attentively to this sad uh, reality, but also to take these very interesting findings
and turn them into a dusty file for the European Court of Human Rights. Eh? And we know, both of us, how much we have suffered from these dusty files. So over to you, Thomas. Thank you. I have a presentation also. Well, thank you, uh, Stefanos. Uh, thank you, Maria, for this very interesting uh, presentation. And thank you very much to the organizers for uh, convening this conference and uh, this particular panel. I am very grateful. I speak about immigration detention quite regularly. And I have to admit, it is the very first time that I'm on a panel with a psychologist. And um, I wonder why this has not come up uh, as an idea before. But I took some, uh, I think, a lot out of uh, your presentation already, and uh, we'll try to connect it back to our case law. Um, the structure of my presentation, I do have a small and short PowerPoint, um, but I will mostly speak freely. I mean, I have some information on cases that I will speak about there. Um, but I do not want, want to repeat uh, what has partly already been said um, this morning. So first of all, I would like to outline briefly the criteria, how we assess the cases, and then exemplify how we dealt with particular vulnerabilities in particular cases, and based on that, um, try to draw some, uh, some conclusions. Um, before the two preliminary remarks uh, from my side, uh, first, uh, Maria has now spoken a lot about detention and transit zones in Hungary. Um, on Monday last week, the Grand Chamber panel uh, accepted the case Elias and Ahmed versus Hungary for adjudic uh, adjudication in the Grand Chamber, and it concerns this very issue, the de, de facto deprivation of liberty in the Hungarian transit zones at the border to uh, Serbia. It also concerns the removal of the persons concerned to Serbia as a safe third country. Um, the two applicants are, however, not uh, children. I mean, they're adult men from Bangladesh. But uh, this issue will, or this situation will be assessed a bit more thoroughly soon. Now, before I turn to the merits of our case law, um, I would like to briefly connect to a question that I've seen on the screen or in the morning. It's like, who uh, holds states accountable if uh, detained children don't have a legal representative. Now, this, in my experience, is one of the biggest challenges in this thematic area. When I worked for UNHCR in the field in a transit country in Europe, children were quite systematically detained, and as soon as they were released from detention, they left the country. With no contact to legal representatives, now, even if an application with our court would have been lodged, by the time you lose contact to your legal representative, it will result in a strikeout decision. So we will not assess the merits. That being said, on substance, many of these cases will raise Article 3 complaints or Article 3 issues. In fact, um, all cases that we've so far adjudicated on the merits involving the detention, immigration detention of children found of an Article 3 violation. So in, in, in one way, you have, in substance, very important cases. And procedurally, many of them will never reach the court in a way that we can decide on substance. This is, I believe, uh, a challenge and shortcoming of the convention system as it is that we need to take into account when we speak about immigration detention of children. Now, with these preliminary remarks, uh, let me just remind you of the immigration detention as a whole. Uh, Article 5.1.F of the Convention has been mentioned a number of times um, this morning um, in the Grand Chamber uh, Judgment in Saudi versus United Kingdom. Um, it was found that uh, for adult, uh, adult asylum seekers with no particular vulnerabilities, um, there's no taste, uh, test of necessity, but rather one of arbitrariness before cumulative criteria. Um, so, meaning that under the convention, it's very much possible to detain adults, but also children. There's no part in the convention that does not, that uh, or prohibits the detention of, uh, of children as such. So how do we approach these cases? Primarily, um, under Article 5.1.F, um, 
we distinguish from the Saudi case that, uh, that you've just seen, saying for vulnerable people, you also must look for alternatives to detention. There's kind of a proportionality or, national, uh, or necessity um, test. And then we take a very close look at the conditions of detention, but also at the duration of detention, about the age of the child, and the personal history or personal circumstances of um, the child. Um, I would like to, to note also in that regard that we have repeatedly said, um, for example, in the case of Rahimi versus Greece that has been mentioned already uh, this morning, um, that the level of protection under the convention that states need to uh, provide may vary depending on whether the child is uh, accompanied or not. But to add on that, whether the child is accompanied or not, this does not absolve uh, in either scenario um, the state from its obligations um, or make the, uh, the, the detention uh, compatible with uh, the convention. I'd rather say that when it concerns unaccompanied uh, children, um, I have difficulties imagining uh, a detention scenario that would comply with, uh, with the convention. Um, now mostly, also as uh, Mr. Giacomopoulos has said, we would um, assess or fill the vacuum um, by assessments under Article 3 of the convention. And why do we do that? Um, first of all, because yes, it raises issues of degrading and inhuman treatment. Um, but also Article 3 is relative and depends on the circumstances of the, of the individual case. So you would very much take into account age, sex, health, um, particular vulnerabilities um, and, the, and the story of the individual child. Now, against these criteria, how do we apply this in cases and how does it link back to um, what you have said, Maria? We, um, I've said here Rahimi versus Greece, as uh, has been mentioned, it was a 15-year-old boy from Afghanistan who was detained for two days. He was unaccompanied in a detention center for adults um, in poor hygienic um, conditions. Um, it was, all, uh, first of all, a, a violation of Article 5 of the Convention because no, uh, his best interests have not been taken into account and no alternatives were considered. But it's also a very clear finding that the conditions were so poor in this police station that even though the detention was only two days, that was an Article 3 violation. So in other words, as sort of the first principle I can give you, like sort of following from this case, is if the conditions of detention are very poor, no matter how short the detention is, it will uh, violate uh, the convention. Um, now, when we have families with children. Um, one case that I find particularly interesting uh, is Kanagaratnam versus Belgium. It was a, a mother uh, from Sri Lanka with uh, three children uh, detained together with adults for a period of four months. Um, and what I like about this judgment is how the court assessed the individual circumstances of the case. Um, the family had previously, and they had fled from Sri Lanka, had experienced civil war there, they had been to uh, the Congo before, they had written, the children had witnessed the arrest of their father, and then they were arrested directly at the border in Belgium. And the court said, ah, but that must have been a re-traumatizing experience for the children. They also took into account that uh, the mother was an analphabet and could not fulfill the role of the parent, as you have just described, saying, oh, but then the children got even more stressed because nobody could care um, for them. So I think it's a very um, good assessment where you can see a number of points uh, that you have mentioned, Maria, coming out in uh, the court's assessment. What I would like to note maybe <laughs> on a side note in the case of Kanagaratna, is there had been a previous Belgian case um, that uh, Ms. Powerford had been, discussed, uh, had been discussing this morning where there was a medical certificate. In Kanagaratnam, there was no medical certificate. 
And uh, the court has said, well, we note that this is a distinction to the case we've previously decided, but nonetheless, we feel able to continue our assessment and say, despite the absence of medical evidence, despite the uh, of psychological or psychiatric uh, evaluation, we feel able to say the children feel anxiety, inferiority, stress amounting to a level that breaches Article 3 of the Convention. Um, yeah, we will see that practice again later on. Um, another case that I would like to um, discuss more about material conditions now is Popov versus France, um, where uh, a family with two small children was uh, detained in a detention center that was under French law authorized to accommodate families. Um, there the court took a very close look about the material conditions at the camp or at the detention center. Um, and it said, it may have been designated under French law uh, as suitable for families, but in reality it is not. It had uh, beds with uh, iron uh, on the top that was uh, dangerous for the children. It had automatic doors. It was a very hostile uh, atmosphere. There were no play areas or activities for children. And uh, even though it was only 15 days, which is maybe not the longest period of time, for the children not having any concept or any time limit when they would be deported is a lose, losing of hope or losing of control because it feels endless. I think this is also some of the, the um, aspects that you had mentioned, Maria, and um, there the court had said, oh, that must have for the children created a situation of stress and anxiety with traumatic consequences um, resulting in the finding of an Article 3 violation. Now, the counterpoint to the case of Popov is uh, the case of AB and others versus France um, that was decided last July, a series of five cases uh, with AB and others being the leading one. Um, it was a couple with a four-year-old um, child. Um, interestingly, the deportation was ordered legally against the parents only. Now, we have heard early in the morning um, that you have family unity, children should not be separated from their parents. At the same time, children should also not be detained. Um, so what did the court do with it? Saying, oh, actually, the parents said, we don't really have anywhere to give our child to, or anybody. Um, so the child comes with us. So the court said, well, then de facto, detention was ordered against the child. Um, and even though there was never a legal decision to be assessed, we, it was just assessed or examined at the court um, on this factual uh, deprivation of liberty. And uh, unlike in Popov, the court having regard to a number of reports from the Ombudsman for Children, uh, in France to different NGOs said, actually the material conditions um, in the center are good. Um, it is a separate area where, uh, for families, it is equipped for child care, you have uh, child appropriate uh, health care, um, you have the ability for leisure. The only um, practical concern, so to say, uh, was that it was located directly next to the airport at very high noise levels, um, meaning that uh, children would be, when they went outside to play, um, very much affected by that noise. But otherwise, the court clearly said the material conditions are acceptable. Um, and nonetheless, uh, the the court then said, yeah, the detention itself has constraints and causes stress um, for the children, but also the child experiencing how the parents sustain that distress uh, in detention. The court also looked at the fact that the child 
attended all the meetings all day long with the parents, being uh, in exchange with lots of people in, in uniform. Um, and the court said, well, detention always causes stress and uh, it's not in the best interest of the child. It's not explicitly said, but it's, it's very clear implicitly in the judgment, but saying but you can accept that because you may, as a state, be in the position that you have to remove a certain family and that is the only way you can do it is by a brief detention um, prior to removal. Uh, and then the court said, yeah, but 18 days is not brief. 18 days is not sufficiently brief, so it was an Article 3 violation. That same day, it um, decided four other cases. Um, in some cases, even decided that seven days were too long. So what you can take from that judgment is saying, well, even if the material conditions are good, you first need to consider alternatives. Uh, if there no, is no alternative, because maybe the person does not have a passport, no address, has expressed a desire not to return, does not cooperate with the border police, then you can detain, but for a very brief period, seven days being too long. So what I, we have not set a categoric limit how long you can detain, but from that wording I would assume one, two, three days. I don't know, maybe four, I don't know, but the longer I would find um, difficult. Um, there is one more thing that I, or one more case that I would briefly like to discuss that was here earlier on because it concerned uh, unaccompanied minors um, that were almost adults because uh, Maria, you had also mentioned age assessment procedures and um, there the persons concerned were 16, 17 years old. They were detained with adults uh, and it took uh, eight months until the age assessment was done. And the authorities had not gone, uh, given any good reason why it took um, so long. And uh, during that time there were no proper facilities, no counseling, educational assistance or just uh, information. Um, for the applicants. Um, so the court found that it was uh, an Article 3 violation and it was also an Article 5 violation because the authorities had not displayed um, good faith. Um, so you can, from that, take away that when vulnerable people are detained, you must have procedures to detect the vulnerability, to assist vulnerable people and to act diligently and swiftly. Um, in other cases, not concerning children, as my final remarks, for example, when we dealt with uh, pregnant women, and for example, in Aden Ahmed versus uh, Malta, we found a violation because there was also no lack of, uh, there was no female staff in the detention center or no adequate medical care. So I think Slowly but surely, if you look at all the cases together, you can find quite a lot of the criteria uh, that you found as problematic reflected in the case law. Just it's not in a one, one judgment uh, outlining all the different aspects. Um, I think this would be it from my side. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Thomas, for this. Um very thorough and uh, helpful explanation of the court's case law, which of course uh, supplemented the excellent presentation that we had uh, this morning by Anne Ford. And uh, with that, I would like to open the floor to questions, uh, observations, uh, ways of moving uh, forward based always on the concept of vulnerability. And of course, we are assisted uh, in a very effective manner by technology, which is not my favorite uh, <laughs> topic, but I will try to cope. So, but let's uh, first of all uh, have the live uh, take, uh, uh, yes, from FRA, our colleague from FRA. Uh, this is Adriano Silvestri from, from the Fundamental Rights Agency. Uh, I just wanted to, to say a thank you note, because I mean, for me it was really an eye-opener to have both of you there. When we go around, I mean, 
uh, maybe because I'm a lawyer myself, but we tend very often to focus on the procedural safeguards. And Maria, I think you, you, you really, uh, your intervention opened uh, to me a, a, a new opportunity on the way which we could work. I mean, in terms also of our interventions, I see uh, it's fairly easy when we speak to government authorities that we are very often in contact with, when you speak about smaller children and, and, and their possible effects, but the way you framed the presentation also for older children and, and the fact of highlighting how important it is to have actually healthcare professionals around who can do professional work with this particular, particular group of, of migrants or asylum seekers has been really helpful. So uh, at this stage, I just wanted to say a thank you note, and it was a very good idea to have this, uh, this panel. I have a few specific questions, but first let maybe let the others go. So we have the Belgian colleague at the back. Thank you. Uh, Benoît Van Kersbill from uh, DCI, Defense for Children International. I also would like to join the uh, thanks to uh, t the three presentations because your introduction was also um, very interesting to just uh, set up the scene. Uh, I have a question uh, for Mrs. Uh, Barna. Um, I would say two, two questions. One is, um, we are talking about uh, the traumatic effect of detention of migrant children. Would you see uh, a big difference when it comes to detention in other uh, settings in, for other reasons? I mean, children may be in the detention sometimes for, because they committed offenses and so on. Uh, do you see one specificity uh, linked to the uh, experience in migration that uh, is very particular uh, in regard to other uh, kind of uh, detention? Or is it detention as such that provokes uh, the consequences that you described. And the other question is, um, what kind of therapeutic work is possible in those conditions? Is, is, is it just possible uh, as such? Thank you. Actually, both questions are really important, and if I had more time, I would have elaborated on them uh, myself. Well, the specificity of those children who are detained as asylum seekers, for example, or as, uh, or as migrants versus those who are detained for, for, for other reasons, I would say I don't really have uh, um, experience with other, with other tiger groups, but I would say that uh, asylum seeking children, no matter how small they are, especially if they're part of a family, but, but in any case, they, they know where they come from and they know where they're headed and they have a hope or a scenario in their head uh, why they have survived, what they have survived in order to come to Europe and detention for them is a punishment for a crime that they have not committed. I mean, I found it hard to believe, but uh, in this case of Sedikula that I told you about, this unaccompanied boy, uh, when he started having these, uh, these, these nightmares or these dreams uh, during the night, uh, his companions were telling me that what he's constantly screaming is, why am, I, my, why am I in prison? What have I done? Why am I in prison? This sounds almost like a Hollywood movie. I couldn't even believe at first. But what we can see is really the the profound sense of injustice and hopelessness comes from the fact that they feel that they are being punished for, for having survived and for have, having come all the way here. And I think that this is something almost unimaginably hard as an emotional burden on them. Uh, the second, the second uh, about the second question. Well, th uh, therapeutic work, psychotherapy is not possible with people who ha do not have the basic security. And we're talking about physical security, um, financial security, legal security. Uh, psychotherapy uh, is, uh, as such, uh, is impossible. What is possible is psychosocial support, and what is possible is crisis intervention. So what we do on a short term with people is first of all to assess their needs, to assess their vulnerability, because Hungary is among those countries which does not have any identif identification measure for uh, vulnerable persons, uh, especially the invisible, easy, invisibly vulnerable ones such as torture victims, for example. So we do, an, uh, we have an assessment of vulnerability and we provide medical legal reports which are, uh, which serve as uh, evidence in the asylum procedure. And this is again something that only coordinates 
Iliadas in Hungary. Um, we also provided previously uh, medical uh, reports and psychological reports to state that somebody is not suitable for retention. Uh, the problem was that uh, by providing these, these reports could only function as long as we had open facilities in Hungary, and as long as we could argue that this person is not suitable for detention, place him in an open facility. At this point, it's not possible because there are no open facilities in Hungary, as paradoxical as it sounds. So, um, and uh, of course, uh, support and crisis intervention and sometimes medications are uh, equally important. Uh, we are convinced that there are some people, some minors, some unaccompanied minors who are holding on uh, uh, in the transit zone for months and months and, are do and they are doing so because uh, we are in touch and we are regularly in touch and they have somebody to communicate to and somebody to ventilate to as long as they wait there. I mean, this is definitely not psychotherapy, but we hope that it's still worth something. Thank you, Maria. And I know that uh, this is perhaps a separate issue, but uh, since you talk about uh, therapy, perhaps you might want to address also the second question there on the screen, which is, I think, also linked to prevention. Eh? Are there ways uh, for governments to make it more bearable for minors? I think this is a topic that has uh, come up uh, many, in many cases uh, uh, in, during this conference because the question is always, are there, are there circumstances of detention which are good enough to uh, justify the detention of children? And I, as a mental health professional, of course, I have to say that there aren't. But once detention is taking place, there is a difference between the, uh, the availability of psychosocial support, uh, the environment suitable for children, activities provided for the family, as well, family therapy or family counseling. These are uh, things that matter a lot. They matter in preserving uh, mental health of people in detention up to the point that the harm is not too big for them not to be able to recover after detention. That's the, that's the point. I would say that if somebody develops a major psychiatric disorder in detention, we have a very hard uh, time with them after being released. Uh, while if we can preserve a basic level of, of uh, security and, uh, and of emotional um, health, then we are better off later on. We cannot achieve the disappearance of symptoms while somebody is in such a situation as a detention, but we, we can keep up a certain standard, I would say. So there are measures. And I think that psychosocial support, the presence of psychologists and psychiatrists, I think it's vital. I mean, I, I, what we have now in Hungary, I don't know if there are any other member states where this is the case, that there is absolutely no mental health care provided to asylum seekers. is is unprecedented, by the way. So I, we are not yet aware of the consequences, but we will be soon if it doesn't change. Thank you. So what we take from your answer is that the emphasis is, is always on the harm. Eh? It's not that the conditions would be good, but we can intervene in order to prevent or rather repair the harm. Eh? This is what to, you seem to be saying. Yes, yes. to okay. prevent the harm, which cannot be prevented 100%. <laughs> yes, in exactly. Any case. So are there any other questions from the floor? Yes, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I work for the French uh, um, NMP, Le Contrôle Général des Lieux de Privation de, de Liberté, which is in control of all the uh, facilities where people are locked in. And I know quite well the French one you were talking about, Mr. Straub. What I wanted to, to, to tell you is um, for the question about the very young children, um, I, I met several times couples with very young babies in those facilities. And it's quite uh, uh, fascinating to see that very, very rapidly the babies react to the fact of being locked in, even if it doesn't last for ages. Uh, some lose their hair, some stop drinking. Uh, when the women uh, cannot breastfeed their babies, the babies don't want to drink either water or milk. Uh, given by the uh, the wardens uh, at the very beginning, even in the first days, uh, the uh, consequences are absolutely obvious for for those young children. It was just a testimony for that. <laughs>
So I think, uh, Thomas, uh, perhaps this is uh, uh, the time when you can also uh, provide some additional input. And uh, we have some questions on the screen for you. Mm -hmm. So does the Court of Human Rights examine thoroughly enough the impact of detention on migrant children? And how short a detention should be in order for it to be compatible with the European Convention on Human Rights? And, and if I can add one question of my own, uh, you said that when, when, you, when the court looks at Article 3, mm -hmm. you also take into consideration the personal characteristics um, of the applicant, mm -hmm. uh, and you mentioned health, age, um, gender, etc. Uh, would you, do you think that the court could also take into consideration the legal status of the person, like asylum seeker vis-a-vis -vis irregular migrant, or is it something that uh, escapes this, the equation? Um. Okay, I um, I start. I think from uh, from the screen, does uh, the the court examine thoroughly enough the impact detention has on migrant children? Now, <clears throat> it's a very difficult question, and I'm not sure whether I am professionally able to 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 answer it uh, as a lawyer. Um, I had mentioned in the Belgian case Kanagaatnam. Um, that the court just did its own assessment of the impact on the child, saying there's no medical certificate in this case, but we had a similar case before where we had a medical certificate, so we draw similar conclusions. Likewise, in this case, A, B, and others, there was actually a medical certificate about the child that had um, attributed a uh, polymorphous manifestations of psychiatric disorders um, related to a destabilization of family life, precarity of day-to-day -day surroundings, uprooting and a loss of habitual references. Um, the government had disputed this, uh, that this disorder that has been certified was uh, caused by the detention, so it's not clear from the diagnosis that it's related to the detention. In the court then, uh, <laughs> solved the problem, saying the court further finds, without having to rely on the medical certificate uh, produced by the applicants, that the constraints inherent in the place of detention and goes on and goes on, saying um, it's a significant source of stress and anxiety, um, leading to mental and emotional um, aggression that would have harmful consequences for um, a young child. So, what can I say about this? Um, first, whenever there's a medical certificate, we, I think, gladly align ourselves with the finding of that uh, certificate. Um, knowing that those doing this examination are much more competent to assess the impact on the child uh, than we as lawyers are. Um, where we do not have a certificate um, or its relevance or reliability is disputed, um, I think we would be inclined to um, draw conclusions as we have drawn in similar cases um, before, um, knowing our uh, limitations um, imposed by our profession. Um, so I think we try our best, but I don't think it's our assessment of the impact is as deep as it is by, if it's done by a psychologist. Um, that also being said, for those of you who may bring cases to the court or may argue cases before the court um, or request interim measures, um, I think it's very relevant uh, if you include a medical certificate to that and saying this is the impact the detention has on the child. The second question, um, the de facto ban on migrant child detention. Um, maybe ban is too much, um, but I, it really makes it very clear that it's uh, only in very exceptional circumstances. And let me remind you, we talk here about um, young children with their parents. 
I mean, I'm not even getting into the idea of unaccompanied children. I'm not really sure whether we would, to the extent that they would be removed, whether we would um, find this compatible with the convention um, at all. But um, I think the threshold following from, from the decisions against France of last year is the material conditions must be very good. It must be the last resort meaning also for the authorities or for the domestic courts, you must consider all alternatives and you must provide reasons why these alternatives do not work. And then you can detain for a short period of time, bearing in mind that seven days are too long. So it's, I don't know, maybe three days, as I said. So I think this is quite an effort um, for the state to have a detention center with these conditions, to do, make the assessment in the individual legal case and to get it all done very quickly. Um, this may, I think, uh, in quite a few cases be too much uh, for a state to engage in it. So it might be easier to rely on an, uh, on an alternative, uh, just um, being, being uh, less complicated uh, in terms of uh, legality. Um, now, Stefanos, you asked me about personal circumstances, um, asylum-seeking children versus irregular migrant children. Um, I think we would take both into account. I mean, also, as, as Ms. Power Ford has said uh, this morning, um, with the vulnerability or persons of vulnerable, vulnerable groups uh, that we look at. We have detainees, we have children, we have asylum seekers. I see no need for the purpose of detention to make a distinction between uh, asylum seekers and uh, irregular migrants. Because, I don't know, but uh, from... Uh, maybe with asylum seekers, they may have a protection need in their country of origin. Um, but I think also some of the irregular migrants, or especially children, may simply by being maybe unaccompanied minors in a regular situation, similarly have protection needs, maybe of a different um, kind, may not um, understand fully um, the, uh, the asylum procedure. And I would, for purposes of making a detention assessment, I think I would not make a, a distinction between the two. Thank you very much. This is uh, quite, a, a, quite a clear answer. So we have three questions now from the floor or um, observations. So Ben from the uh, Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights, the gentleman on the fourth row at the very end, and then the agent of the Swiss government. Uh, thanks, Stefanos. And, and um, I want to echo Adriano's point. I think this has been a really helpful discussion, and it's great to have especially both the legal expertise as well as the psychosocial expertise on the, on the panel. I think it, it really enriches our conversation. I don't have a question so much as a comment. I want, or maybe a, a gentle plea of support from our end, from the High Commissioner, but then also just as an individual human being. I, I think the way that these conversations often go is what do we have to do to avoid violations of Article 3? Which is, of course, an important thing to do, but it's really a, somewhat of a disappointing framing. What do we have to do to not torture children? And, and to the policymakers in the room and the, and the international advocates and human rights experts in the room, I, I, I guess I would like to support us all to reframe the conversation in terms of how we push this policy forward. I mean, using this conference as an opportunity um, and I suggest we do that by asking the question, what would it look like to create uh, conditions that are truly supportive uh, and provide care and protection for children? And so perhaps that's a question for Maria. Um, as a psychosocial worker, as a psychologist, what would it look like for your own child or your brother and sister's child or whatever to what would you want that to look like if they entered a new country, a foreign country, and had come through some sort of migration experience where you can imagine there was trauma? What would, where would you want them to be housed? What sort of services would you want them to have? And can we rally around, collectively, all of us here at this conference, uh, 
core values of child protection rather than sort of a defensive posture of what do we have to do to be compliant. So. Um, yes, my name is uh, Morten Stefansen. I come from Norway, and um, I'd like to. I have a comment, uh, especially on Maria's intervention, because I think uh, after listening to it, and it's it's very easy to believe that if the children were not placed in detention, uh, if they were placed in reception centers, uh, like in Norway and Sweden that they can come and go as they like, and they can go to school and everything, then there wouldn't be any problem, but that's not the case. <laughs> because many of the problems or psychological problems you describe, we also see uh, among some of the unaccompanied minors that are placed in um, reception centers for a long period of time, and especially those who have um, um, a limited stay that they can stay in Norway until they are 18 and then they know that they, their residence permit will not be renewed and they will have to go back when they are 18 to the country of origin and they develop many of the same psychological symptoms, problems that you described. So there's not any easy solution to the problems even though they have access to therapists, they go to school. Um, so um, I think one of the key issues here is when children lose hope, uh, whether they are in detention or whether they are in an open reception center, that is um, very difficult for them to cope with, especially if they're alone without their family support. So it's not to, I'm proud to say that in Norway we don't have these detention centers except in very few cases before some families are sent out of the country. But um, it doesn't mean that we don't have any of these problems that you describe. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I have a question to Mr. Uh, Straub. Uh, thank you to all of you for your interventions and presentations. I find this, sec uh, this session uh, particularly interesting, I must say. Uh, my question relates uh, to the comparison between accompanied and non-accompanied children. As I understand it, there is a case law which is getting more and more restrictive concerning accompanied children. And I think the case AB that you have presented is probably the most far-reaching um, because there the conditions were acceptable, the time was relatively short, and you mentioned another case with seven days. So quite a very short time, and you also mentioned maybe in the future it will even come down to three or four days. Compared with children who are alone, um, I wonder whether the same conditions apply. If the conditions are all right, does the court apply the same um, the same deadline, so to say. My impression is that the court for this constellation is more generous. And then I wonder whether this is coherent because accompanied children, they at least have their parents. And I'm convinced that we should, in normal situations, we should not separate them from the parents. But the other ones may be completely alone. They don't know anyone, they don't understand anything, and they're Maybe you correct me, but I have the impression that the court still today is more generous. Is this impression correct? Okay, so I think uh, both the, the questions are addressed uh, to, to both of you. But perhaps since, you know, given the last comment, which also raised the question of, of understanding uh, how much unaccompanied minors can understand what is happening to them. Perhaps, Maria, in this connection, you could also answer the very first question that has been there for quite a, uh, sorry. Now the second question that has been uh, uh, there for quite some time, the difference depending on the age of the children, eh? because of course somebody who is 17 will be able to understand a little bit better than somebody who is, let's say, 10 or. We, we have even seen unaccompanied uh, children who were 
I can't remember why, t 10 to 12, eh? uh, as, as low as that. So, perhaps you start mm -hmm. first. So I, I'll start with this last uh, question. Yes, I mean, of co obviously, the level of understanding varies on, on the basis of age, but, but, but you should consider that uh, small children in detention maybe experience this hopelessness and is, if, uh, this loss of control even more, because as children, they actually do have less uh, power on, on uh, you know, influencing the, the, the situation and the outcome of, of their home, whole procedure. So they might not understand anything about about the environment, about why are they surrounded with policemen, about why their parents are crying, about why are they treated as criminals. Uh, uh, an adult uh, might have more, more adult coping mechanisms and might, might understand more. At the same time, they might me, be more aware of um, the horrible consequences of, let's say, their asylum ca case being refused. So I think that the hopelessness is there on both sides, but on, in very different ways and in, 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 in very different topics. Um, I don't know if I should come to the answers of, of, yes, of the yes, other do, questions. Yes, yes. Um, what, it's, it's a very difficult question to answer, like what would I imagine ideal if, if my children were to appear as migrants or, or, or God forbid, unaccompanied <laughs> minors in another country. But I would say that the, the basics, I mean, this, this could be the topic of a whole study, I guess, but the basics are obviously freedom and the supportive community, be that of the family or be that of, 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 of guardians um, um, for those children who are under the child, uh, under child protection system, uh, a community that is able, in which they're able to function as, as kids. This can be the school if they, can, if they are actually, they have access to education. This can be the communities, uh, community of the center uh, for unaccompanied minors, or as I said, the family. And the third thing is, uh, is of course, some form of hope, and the hope obviously very much is connected to the legal uh, you know, situation that they are in. So if they know that once they have, will have uh, uh, reached 18, they can be deported to their country of origin, that uh, there we have a, a, a very huge sense of insecurity that no therapy and no support can, can counter. So uh, these children are in very different, difficult situations, same way as um, children in in any country who grow up without their, uh, without their parents, let's say, or who come from difficult uh, social backgrounds. So I am definitely not saying that children who have to face all these problems in liberty have no such problems, because we do, we do know that they have. Uh, it's just that as long as we be believe that there, is, there are treatments that work in their case, as long as we believe that we can improve their conditions, we can say that if we pay, place them in detention, they will simply have no access, no possibility to uh, achieve anything or to heal or to receive treatment because detention cuts off all those basic chances that are the minimum standard to, to, to actually reach some improvement. So uh, substance abuse is there, behavioral problems are there, psychological problems are there also in the case of those who are free. It's just that they can be treated given a proper system, of course. I don't know if there is anything that I haven't quite, I mean, you know, we could talk about this for a much longer time, but. There's some more questions. Okay, um, thank you. I, uh, I would like to, to, may I ask you uh, back, uh, Ms. Mr. Schumann, do you have a uh, particular case in mind with regard to unaccompanied uh, children where the court is more generous? No, I have not a concrete case in mind, but my impression is that the development in the case law uh, with these deadlines in the French cases of last year, there were several cases, uh, this was concerned um, accompanied children, and we didn't see it, in, to my mind, for, for um, non-accompanied children. Um, yes, I, I think there are several, uh, several aspects uh, to it. Um, to, to my knowledge, or I cannot recall having had a single case uh, or seen a single case on unaccompanied children uh, and detention where we found it was compatible with the convention. I think, as I've initially mentioned, we simply do not have as many cases coming, be it that maybe they get detained somewhere on the route and absconded, have no contact with the lawyer, 
and we uh, the cases we have are quite uh, quite few. Um, we we had this one now uh, concerning Malta uh, last year, where the 16 and 17 year olds were detained for eight months, and I agree with you that the language there is um, not as strict as in A, B, and others. Um, making a step back saying previously when we or generally when we assess the immigration detention of children under article 3 we look at the material conditions of detention duration of detention the age of the child and personal history so i think you can see a similarity to article 8 cases um, concerning maybe expulsion of a child or lack of family reunification where the court at times tends to be inclined, saying, oh, but the child is actually 15, 16, 17, and is increasingly able to fend for themselves. Um, whether that is convincing or not um, is, is very much up for a debate. But I think just to, to take a clear stand, we would need uh, an application where the an unaccompanied child is detained for, lat for a rather short time, and then we could um, address uh, that. Thank you, Thomas. I think perhaps now it's the time to, to, to look uh, at, at at least you know three interrelated questions on the screen because somehow it seems that it is assumed by at least some participants that if the if the, uh, the detention is of a very short duration that it is compatible with the convention, and I think that uh, perhaps is not a, a full understanding of, of the case law as it stands today. Because it's not only the duration, it, it, it's also other factors that come into consideration, the conditions, etc. So this is one question. And to, to this question, of course, uh, the last question is related that we see in the screen, whether you know, we should allow for uh, the detention of uh, minors only for educational purposes and in order to be brought be to, before a, lawful, a, lawful, a competent authority and to forget about migration detention altogether, which is the message that uh, comes from the Inter-American uh, Court of Human Rights. And then to, to, to these two questions, you, the question on alternatives to detention in the case of the court is linked. So if you perhaps you can deal with all these three in one go. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'll try my best. Now, uh, <laughs> thank you. Now, first of all, um, about the short detention, um, yes, you said it also depends on material conditions uh, and other circumstances, but above all also that it's a last resort, that you do not have alternatives. Um, in this regard, I would just like to, to mention from this uh, by now famous case, AB and others, uh, versus France, that the father, Mr. A.B., um, had, uh, so they had their asylum application rejected. They were asked to leave the premises of uh, where the reception center where they had stayed. He um, did not present uh, sufficient guarantees uh, remedying the, the risk that he would not comply. He did not have a valid passport. He had no stable place of residence, no sufficient income. He had not complied with previous directions for his removal. So uh, I think a domestic court could have well made a case saying, actually, this particular person, to ensure the removal, uh, we m must detain him. But. Um, the domestic court has simply not assessed it, saying, and then the court, our court found, look, even though a child was involved, the domestic court has not considered alternatives. We have not said that this or this alternative would have worked. This is how you would have solved the case. In a way, we do not provide the guidance what you would have done to do it right. We just said, look, you haven't assessed it. The decision making process. Yeah, it was yeah. too little. It was not enough. But I think this is generally our, um, I think, uh, somewhat our, our, our point on alternatives to immigration detention. I think we have so far not really provided positive guidance as to alternatives and case scenarios where would, we would really um, see it work. But mostly it was a. Uh, the, the cases that we had was saying, oh, but you have not considered alternatives, you have not provided reasons why alternatives did not work. Um, 
Now, article. Uh, yeah, also five one D five one F. Um, five. <laughs> I think it's uh, it is a very positive approach that the Inter American Court has um, taken. Um, whether it would hold under the convention, I'm not sure. Uh, to uh, let's let's say it like that. I think uh, uh, we we could maybe argue that uh, children should not be detained as being the primary addressee of the detention. But if you say, oh, but it's actually against the parents and the children have to be considered as well already in the decision-making process. Um, because otherwise, I mean, you, you would also not allow for, under no circumstances, for the detention of uh, parents under 5.1.F because uh, if, if otherwise they would get separated from the children. So I think this might go a bit, uh, as much as I um, feel positive about this approach, I think uh, this might go a bit uh, too far for the court at this point in time. Um, and finally, about Article 8. Um, yes, of course. I mean, even if it does not reach the threshold under Article 3, it can contravene Article 8. I mean, this is uh, just a different assessment uh, to make. OK, so uh, there is one more question left uh, on the screen, uh, if I understand correctly. Uh, and uh, then we have one question from the back of the room. But um, since we're getting close to, to the end of this session, uh, I would like to, to remind also in connection with what uh, Thomas has said, that the convention, of course, applies, is, is the minimum standard in Europe today. Eh? So we should not be uh, considering the, the, the convention and the court's case law as panacea. Eh? If you look at the convention carefully, it says towards the end that nothing in the convention means, can be interpreted to say that states cannot have higher standards. Eh? So this is really the threshold below which you cannot fall. Eh? So perhaps, uh, as Ben said earlier, we should be discussing also positive uh, examples, eh? good practices, more forward-looking practices, eh? rather than looking at the very minimum that uh, the convention um, represents. And uh, before inviting Maria to comment on the factual situation in Hungary, uh, I would like to say that uh, the special representative of the Council of Europe will also publish very soon a, a report on Serbia and also on the two transit zones in Hungary. And there you are going to find a lot of interesting factual material about uh, what, what uh, prevails there and what the main challenges are. So let's take the, the question from the back and then Maria, you can also answer the question about uh, what happens in the transit zones. As a matter of fact, it's not a, a question, but just a comment or a reminder. Um, we noticed that the, the European Court of Human Rights has limits in its capacity to control uh, detention of children, of migrant children. Uh, among others, you have to exhaust national remedies, so many cases do not reach the level of the court. It takes a long time at national level. A child who is in detention uh, will have uh, big difficulties to, uh, just to access to a lawyer, to have information. I mean, all the barriers just to access to justice are uh, probably even bigger uh, when it comes to ch a child in detention. So don't forget that there are other international mechanism that you should make use of and that can apply other principle. Uh, I think that uh, we should make use of the uh, uh, committee, the European Committee on Social Rights uh, on basis of the social, social European Social Charter, who also has many provision concerning protection of children. And I don't see any situation of uh, detention of migrant children that uh, comply with those provisions. And also for the states who have ratified OP3, the third optional protocol on, under the Convention on the Right of the Child, I think that the, con the Committee on the Right of the Child can also have a broader approach about detention. Uh, the Convention is, of course, broader uh, on many aspects. So don't forget to use all those mechanisms too. So, Maria, uh, in one minute, your take on the situation in the transit zones in Hungary. And then I will make some organizational uh, uh, announcements. 
So we did end up talking about Hungary in the end, <laughs> which I'm I'm okay with because I really think I mean apparently my sadness and my anger has transpired <laughs> even through a presentation of a slightly different focus. Um, the things are two. One is that in Hungary, when uh, this whole transit zone regime was introduced, it was introduced gradually. So for example, it was us, uh, Cordelia, and me personally, one of the two colleagues who have written the medical legal reports, which were. Uh, used in this uh, case of Ilias and Ahmed, which uh, which was uh, which ended up in the uh, in front of the European Court of Human Rights. So we did provide the medical legal reports in this case. Um, after this, we were banned from the transit zone. Obviously, there was no explanation given, but it, this might have contributed. So those people who were before in uh, asylum detention in Hungary could not abscond when the transit zone regime was introduced. So they were just shipped from uh, the various detention centers to the transit zones. Those who were placed in open facilities obviously left Hungary as it is uh, you know, logical to imagine. So uh, the patients whom we are following in the transit zones via internet and it's very, I mean, it's just ridiculous the way how one has to, we are, we are communicating in writing basically, but they are the ones who had been our patients previously in other facilities. So we are not meeting the newcomers asylum, new coming asylum seekers, which means also that none of them gets a medical report based on the Istanbul protocol to serve as, a, as a evidence in their asylum procedure because we don't get access to them. Uh, what, when we encounter them again is when they, let's they receive uh, some form of international protection and they are released from the transit zones. So that's the moment when we meet them again. Uh, the only exception are the unaccompanied minors uh, below 14 because uh, uh, they still fall under the uh, Child Protection Act in Hungary, so they're not placed in the transit zones. But that's, that's, that's about it. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Thomas. So, uh, I think this has been a, a very good and thought-provoking uh, session, and the discussion will continue in the plenary. So, at 4.30, uh, we have to meet at the Grand Hall upstairs, and there will be a report uh, from this session. Uh, in the meantime, you can enjoy your coffee break again upstairs, but before we do so, I think we have to, you have to join me in uh, giving a round of applause to our two excellent uh, speakers. <laughs>